completely cool, they become satisfied with little and normally then they go their own way, living alone, going to a cave, a small cootie somewhere else. That was definitely also the end of the part, yeah. It's relatively safe. I was nervous about the snakes. Mm. Uh, one monk was killed here by a snake. Heavy duty poisonous ones are here, rustled by, uh, you know, they do ones that they're one bite job. And uh, they come out at night. There's a river there with frogs, and it's just mm. ideal for them. So. <laughs> So, envy, Nyanavira. January yeah. 1965, I believe, when I was in Mundala. A deep jungle, thick jungle there, and I was tramping the jungle searching for wild boar. And I went to the village there, and the villagers told me that there was a white man who was a monk there. I was surprised as a journalist, and I thought I'd go and see him to do a story later. I came back to him when Robin Mom, who was Somerset Mom's nephew, who was a travel writer, novelist, he came to Sri Lanka, so on then. Sri Lanka and wanted to want a story. While we were talking with him, with Robin Mom, a tan tula fell from the hoof. And he picked it up and he held it in his hand. We were horrified. He held it in his hand and he said, No, he's not going to hurt you. And I think the, Robin took a picture of it. The picture appeared in the, in the article, him holding his tan tula. The older one is Robin Mom a nephew of the celebrated Somerset Maugham. He is a novelist, third-rate I suspect, and a writer of travel books. Although they both seemed interested in the Dharma, I rather think that their principal reason for visiting me was to obtain material for their writings. So probably, in perhaps a year's time, there will be a new travel book with a chapter, complete with photographs, devoted to yours truly and the romantic life he is leading in the jungle. What was amazing was this white man, Englishman, and he knew his background, how he came there, and what made him, that is more important, I think. He was in North Africa during the campaign, intelligence officer.
And yeah, after his discharge, he didn't have a, need a job in London with another friend of his who we had met in the army. And they, they were you know, sort of buying women and good times they were having. And on his annuity, he didn't have to work ever. Both of them had met somewhere in London in a pub. And then they discussed uh, their past. They were really um, dissatisfied, discontented with the life they were leading. Our past loves can be absolutely dead, even when we meet the loved one again. And so with aesthetic enjoyment. The transcendental sense of Mozart's G minor quintet, the late Beethoven, Bartok's quartets, so evident to me before I joined the army. Where was it when I got back home after the war? And then said, I said, this is not the proper life for us. Let's go and become, let's go and get ordained as Buddhist monks. So they were ordained there in Lodandua as Jnana Veera, Jnana Moli, both studied the Pali language, studied the Dhamma. In no time, Jnana Veera left Dudandu and got into the forest reserve of Bundala. What is important is not his biography, not what he did, but what he wrote. His interpretation of the Dhamma. Nobody dared or nobody was able intellectually to counteract the notes. They criticized it because it was not traditional. It was creative, unusual, not it completely against the traditions. You see, because whatever we read and whatever we heard in the Dhamma was traditional as given in the texts and interpreted by Buddha Gosa in his commentaries. I think very, very important is, um, I think, his exposition of uh, uh, dependent co-origination, Padit Samuppada. The traditional understanding of Padit Samuppada was that it connects this birth, uh, past birth and the future birth. Now, I think uh, Venerable Jnanavira's explanations were very helpful in understanding that Padit Samuppada is the explanation of what is happening at this very moment in us. So it was in, in uh, normally a Buddhist monk does not de deviate from the traditional teaching. He writes a lot about various readings that he did in literature and he sees the Dhamma in that literature, whatever Ulysses or whatever he reads, he sees the Dhamma. Uh, he had a very analytic mind. Is supposed to have been a very uh, expert in mathematics in the Cambridge University. However much we appreciate Venomanyana Vera and his intellectual cap capacities, a uh, kind of meditative monk like Venomanyana Vimala, he just put it aside. And he may have have a look, a look at it, but at once he took them apart, he said, this is not a necessity. You read the Buddha word. Buddha Varchana you get in the suttas. Keep to it. Practice it. And there are things which are much more fundamental for young monks than looking into a highly philosophical, tendentious work like the Notes on Dhamma. Venomanyana Vira saw that for him and for a good number of Westerners it would be the right path to go through the uh, uh, existentialist. In his letters he is full of, of uh, praise to certain uh, um, Western philosophers, Bradley, Sartre, Camus and so on, because they saw the problem of suffering, he always says that, he saw the problem of suffering, but they were not in a position to see the ground, the foundation of that suffering. 
the reader is presumed to be subjectively engaged with an anxious problem, the problem of his existence, which is also the problem of his suffering. Only in a vertical view, straight down into the abyss of his own personal existence, is a man capable of apprehending the perilous insecurity of his situation. And only a man who does apprehend this is prepared to listen to the Buddha's teaching. According to the text, really the arising of the Dhamma Chakku is entry into the first first uh, stage of the stream, Sotapanna. That is the first first part of the of the realization. First pa first part of the enlightenment, you see. He completely was giving up uh, any kind of uh, uh, establishing a foothold on experience, eternal structures anywhere, whether material or mental, are not to be had anywhere, because it will, one day or other, it will break down, the whole structure will go. And obviously he has understood that when he saw the <clears throat> nature of uh, impermanence in the Kuti in Bundala. <laughs> 